God scrutinizes our trust and he takes it personally. And the reason why I say that can be found in 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7 through 9. That's all right, Terry, just as long as the one is. 2 Chronicles 16, 7 through 9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Is your heart completely his tonight? That's what I had meant when I said that he scrutinizes our trust. His eyes are moving to and fro. I know that I must grieve his heart many times because he watches our decisions, he watches our choices, he, uh, he listens to what comes out of our mouth, and our heart is not completely his all the time. Our trust is not in him and in him alone. But he's look, looking, he's searching for someone who would dare trust him in all things, in all ways, at all times. He scrutinizes who you are trusting tonight. Here in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1, just to show you how much this means to your heavenly Father, to have your whole heart, to have your trust. Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord who carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. They carry out a plan, but it's not the Lord's plan. Have you taken your whole life, and like we talked about Sunday morning, have you said, I will do nothing but what I see my Heavenly Father in Heaven doing? Or are you making plans in conducting your own business. It's a, it's a sh shame at times to realize how we just go our way doing our thing without ever even consulting the Lord. And he says, Israel is carrying out a plan, but it, they didn't get this plan from God. They didn't even seek his advice or his counsel. And then they're making an alliance with others. And as we go on, you're going to see that he's talking about making an alliance with Egypt. In other words, his people were trusting in the world instead of trusting in God. Who make an alliance, and you see there that word for alliance is pretty strong. It's, called, it's talk, talking about the casting of metal, the fusion of metals, when you melt metals down. And so it's talking about you're making an alliance. You're going into partnership with the world system. Now, we live in the world every day, right? Unfortunately, one day we'll be free of this place. And we go and we use doctors and we use medicine. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. But our trust has got to transcend medical science. And just like we prayed for Rick tonight, We've got to trust God first and foremost above all. It's no different than most of us here, I assume, probably have a mortgage on our home. And uh, thankfully, the bank has made a way for us to live in a home and to earn equity, to earn value. But at the same time, our trust must transcend the bank. And our provision, our provider is God and God alone. If you're holding down a job providing for your family every day, you need to thank God that he's given you that job. But your trust is not in your skill set and your trust is not in your boss. Your trust is not in the paycheck. Your trust must transcend all of that to where I trust God for my provision. And if for some reason... I couldn't make it to the doctor if for some reason there was no bank to loan me the money, if for some reason I couldn't work to provide for my family, God would provide. He's not limited by any of those natural means. And so that is where our faith is. That is where our trust is. And he says, but these people are making an alliance with Egypt. And I put there... Uh, Next in your notes, that passage from 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17 that we know so well. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
And I just added there in the notes a note. We are just as defiled, defiled by worldly trust as we are by worldly pleasure. You know, a lot of times we think, well, I'm going to deny myself worldly amusements, worldly pleasure, because that caters to my the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. So I'll abstain from that, and I won't, I won't partake in the pleasures that the world partake of. And yet at the same time, our heart is trusting in Egypt. And when you're trusting in flesh, when you're trusting in Egypt, when you're trusting in the world system, your heart is just as corrupt and defiled as if you took, partook of those worldly pleasures. You've got to understand that. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And I won't take time to read all of it, but he says in verse 17, therefore come out from their midst and be separate from them and touch no unclean thing, and then I will welcome you. So we're talking about our trust not being polluted and corrupted by worldly sources. We trust God and we trust Him alone. And at the very top of your page in the box I put there in your notes, prayer is that exercise and discipline of placing our trust in God. When you pray and you verbalize and express your trust in your Heavenly Father, and you say, Father, I thank you for my job. And I thank you that you are my provider and you've given this to me to make a living for my family, to provide for them. And Father, I thank you for my doctor. He's been so good to me. He's been kind to me. But Father, my trust is really in the great physician. And I thank you for the help that medicine brings. But Lord, my trust ultimately is in you. Because the doctor doesn't know the day that I die, but you've already determined the day that I die. My life is in your hands. And so it's in the, it's in the attitude of the heart, you know, when he says there, come out from their midst to be separate from them. It, it does not mean that you never go to a doctor or you never go to the bank or you never have a job. It, it, that's what, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying there is in the heart. There's got to be that separation to where we trust God and God alone. He goes on in verse 2. He says, Israel has set out to go down to Egypt without even asking for my direction to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Why would you proceed with a plan without even asking for God's direction? Trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't think you know what to do. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him. And that word, yada, is the word for when Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. It's talking about an intimate knowledge, an experiential knowledge. Do you know what God wants for your life? Do you know what he would do in the circumstances that you're facing? Do you know how he would have you respond? Do you truly know him? Don't lean to your own understanding. Don't think you know how to handle life because none of us do. In all of your ways, seek him first and foremost. Know what He wants and what He wants you to do. And as you, in, as you acknowledge Him in all of your ways and truly come to a knowing of Him, He will make straight your paths. It's a wonderful thing how, you know, you're just walking through this life. You don't know three steps down the road, two steps down the road. All you, all you have is just enough light to take the next step. And as you take that next step, then more light comes and you see where the following step will lie. And that's the way God leads us. He wants us to trust even when we don't understand, even when we don't see how this is going to work or we don't see the end of things. But he makes our paths straight for us. And it's, it's just a wonderful thing sometimes to be walking in faith and see that path just come together, just snap into place. 
the further down the road you go. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him. Be not wise in your own eyes. Approach every situation with this attitude, I need help. I need God to speak to me. And that is the kind of trust that God is looking for in you and me. In Isaiah 30, verse 3, he says, if you want to trust in the world system and in worldly methods, if you want to trust in flesh and the alliances that you build with other people, and boy, the world is just full of that, isn't it? I mean, just take a look at our government. Just take a look at our Congress and the deals that they make. Hey, you vote for this, I'll vote for that. Let's compromise this. You know, wink, wink. Well, and the deals that are made, and uh, they're just building alliances just for their own selfish gain. And many times it's not right and it's not just. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. What he's saying here is, if you're going to trust in the flesh and trust in the world and trust in Egypt, you're going to end up being humiliated because God is to be your source. For though his officials are at Zoan and his en- uh, envoys reach Hanes, what he's talking about there is, is uh, how Israel would reach out and travel to Egypt. I love what he says in Isaiah 19, verse 11. He says, The princes of Zoan are utterly foolish. The wisest counselors of Pharaoh give stupid counsel. (laughs) He doesn't uh, hold back any punches, does he? And it's the truth. The counselors of this world, the wisdom of this world is stupid. And we are just as stupid if we trust in anything but the wisdom of our God. Verse 5, everyone comes to shame through a people that cannot profit them, that brings neither help nor profit, but shame and disgrace. Isaiah 42, starting at verse 5, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. Now look at verse 6. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. And look at verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give To what? To no other. God wants your heart. He wants your trust. He wants your whole heart. And His glory, do you know what His His glory is to take you by the hand and to keep you. And He's not going to share that with anybody else. He's not going to tolerate other lovers. He doesn't believe in open marriages. He takes offense when you trust in anything other than Him. He wants to take you by the hand. He wants to keep you. And He won't share that glory with anybody else. He does not share His praise to carved idols. just want you to see His reaction. Verse 6 and back in Isaiah chapter 30, an oracle on the beasts of the Negeb. Through a land of trouble and anguish, from where come the lioness and the lion, the adder and the uh, flying fiery serpent, they carry their riches on the backs of donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people that cannot profit them. You know what this is saying? He's saying, Israel, you risk your lives. You go through the land of trouble and anguish just to get to Egypt, and Egypt isn't going to be able to help you. You go through so much effort and take such great risks trying to find help in a God, in a system, in a world where there is no hope. 
And I just put there in the notes, what if we pursued God with that same fervency that we seek the world? He says, you're really willing to risk it all to go after Egypt's help. Why don't we seek God just as fervently and place our trust in Him? Egypt's health help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab, who sits still. What he's saying there is Egypt's health help is worthless and empty. I call her Rahab, who sits still, because she does nothing. The world, Egypt, is full of gods who can't speak, who cannot hear. They cannot walk. They cannot lift a hand to help. They're just dumb, carved stones, having no life and no power. They just sit there, whereas he is a God who helps. It's the same type of scenario as in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26, when uh, Elijah was challenging the 450 prophets of Baal. And so the prophets of Baal, it says here in verse 26, they took the bull that was given to them and they prepared it and they called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. And look what happens. But there was no voice and no one answered. And if we dare trust in the gods of this world system, if we look to Egypt, if we look to this world system, if we trust in man or trust in the flesh, we're going to come up very empty because there's only one God who hears and answers and saves and delivers and restores and resurrects. And he alone is our help and our trust. And so at noon, Elijah begins to mock them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. And when you and I place our trust in ourselves, in flesh, in the world system, we come up just that empty. There is no God like our God. No one can save like our God can. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7. Remember, this is when the, um, the king of Israel came up against the king of Judah and took Judah under siege. And um, so what does is, what is Asa, the king of Judah, does do? Judah is under siege, so he reaches out to uh, the king of Syria. It says here the king of Aram, but Aram was, is really in central Syria. He's the king of Syria. And so the prophet comes to Asa and he says, because you have relied on the king of Aram... And you have not relied on the Lord your God. Therefore, the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. And what was happening here was Asa was actually making an alliance with an enemy, the king of Syria. And God, through the prophet, is saying, what are you doing, Asa? You could have destroyed an enemy. You could have found peace in this whole process, but you never consulted me. You never relied on me. You were rely, relying on human wisdom, human logic, human alliances when you were supposed to come out and be separate. He says, were not the Ethiopians and the Lubin and an immense army with many, very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. Remember those times when you trusted God and God alone? And what victory you lived in? He says in verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Asa, you have acted foolishly. From now on, you will surely have what? Wars. Just to repeat quickly, if I can. 
God is scrutinizing your trust. And it breaks his heart when he does not have your trust. It breaks his heart when he does not have all of your heart. It breaks his heart when he sees you trusting in and pursuing worldly wisdom, worldly solutions, the arm of the flesh, false alliances with people that you think can get you ahead. God wants all of your heart. And prayer is that time when we can exercise and discipline our faith and our focus to set our trust entirely on Him and say, Father, I'm coming to you tonight. I'm leaving this in your hands. I'm not picking it up again. I'm not taking my life back under my control. I trust you. I cast my care over onto you. And I will wait upon you for an answer. And I won't turn to the flesh or like Lot. I won't think that I have to go back to the city. I will trust you to be my provider, my provision, my salvation, my deliverer. That's what God wants tonight. He wants all of your heart, all of your trust. He's watching to see your decisions and your choices and your prayers. So let's go to him and just express that.